Welcome to Common Sense. Uh, Common Sense is a series of shows that feature interviews with uh, interesting people so that we can learn in a clear, concise, and direct way who these folks are, uh, what they do, and what makes sense to them, and what doesn't. I'm Rudy Breglia, and today I'll be interviewing uh, the uh, award-winning photojournalist, lecturer, visual historian, and owner of Spectralite Photography in North Ridgeville, Mark Minear. Welcome, Mark. Hi, Rudy. Thank you. Well, uh, let's just get started right off the bat. Uh, how have you been involved with photography in Avon Lake? All right. Um, I started out... Uh, by coming out here to the uh, Erie Shores Photography Club. Okay. They had me uh, judge a few contests. They um, also had me do a presentation on photography. And then uh, a couple of years later, um, I had an exhibit here at the Avon Lake Library of my photography. Okay. And then last year, Avon Lake uh, Public Library had me do a presentation on photo restoration. Besides that, my experience in Avon Lake has been photographing the Genon power plant when they were decommissioning it last year. Okay. I did some 360-degree photos and 360-degree video to uh, commemorate the closing of the plant. Then um, after that, my experience in Avon Lake uh, isn't related to photography, but in assisting you in creating your website for the School Bus Seatbelt Safety Alliance. Okay, well, thank you very much for helping Sure, me. sure. Yeah, I had seen that you were doing this. I'd read about you, and I saw you didn't have a website and thought, let me see if I can help you out. That was wonderful. Thank you very much, sure. Mark. Uh, tell us, though, why you chose photography as a career. I guess I just love being around beautiful images. Um, God has created this wonderful planet that has so many beautiful things to see, and to capture and preserve it in photography was something that I thought that I would love to do. I tried drawing and painting, but uh, I cannot draw to save my life, and photography was the easiest way to do it. Okay. Uh, where were you born, uh, Mark, and uh, where have you lived? I was born in Dubois, Pennsylvania. Okay. This is the Dubois Mansion that we're looking at. Okay. Then uh, I went on to Pittsburgh, where I met my wife, She's a Cleveland gal, but we met at the Art Institute of Pittsburgh. And, uh -huh. she's, and she said that um, if I wanted to marry her, I would have to move to Cleveland. <laughs> and being a Pittsburgh fan, um, a Steelers fan and a Pirates fan, that was a hard choice to make, but I did okay, it anyway. Love conquers all. Okay. Yes. <laughs> uh, where did you study photography and what degree did you earn? Okay, I studied at the Art Institute of Pittsburgh. I have my associate degree in specialized technology, majoring in photography multimedia. Okay. Uh, what are some of your causes that uh, are important to you? Well, it's a cause that my wife and my daughters were interested in, and that's uh, saving cats and kittens. Okay. We foster cared some kittens from the APL. And then the other uh, cause is uh, the Olmsted Spirit 5K race. The Olmsted Spirit 5K raises money for college scholarships for Olmsted Falls graduating seniors. I've been the founding sponsor with the race for 25 years. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, when did you uh, first have an interest in photography? I would say it was probably um, in my teenage years. Uh -huh. um, I used to edit my dad's home movies. And at one point, I got a movie camera of my own and decided cinematography was pretty cool. Wow. And in high school then, that's something that I wanted to pursue, but they didn't have any kind of cinematography class, but they did have 35 millimeter. So I started getting into that, and, and that's how I've evolved today. Okay. Uh, tell us about your experience freelancing for uh, two international news service organizations, the uh, Associated Press and uh, United Press International. One of my early experiences with the Associated Press was photographing the Super Bowl celebration in Pittsburgh uh, in 1979. I just photographed a person being um, corralled by a police dog. And within a split second after I took that picture, I was attacked by a police dog. And so we're looking at a photo with uh, the injury of my right calf, I ended oh up getting God. stitches in my leg. Uh, another thing that I had the uh, 
experience of doing is photographing Vice President Walter Mondale in 1980 uh -huh. when he came in for a Labor Day visit. Just before he pulled in with his limo, I was one of the first photographers on site. I was right up against the vehicle, ready to take my pictures, and was told by the Secret Service agent to back away from the vehicle. And I wanted to get my picture, and I wasn't backing away. So he came around, and he gave me a nice big bear hug, lifted me up off the ground, <laughs> and set me aside. So that was kind of an interesting experience. Here's a picture of the uh, Concord SST when it came to Cleveland in 1985. I was the first photographer to see the pilot uh, walking off to the side, and I asked him if he would come over and pose for me for this picture. It was kind of neat because right after I got done taking his picture, I looked around and there were several photographers on either, either side of me taking the same photograph. And then finally on, on this photograph, we have Mr. Rogers of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Wow. He was being presented with a trolley in his honor. So if you look down to the left-hand side, just to the left of him, you can see uh, a little bit of the trolley from Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood painted there. I see. Uh, where do uh, those news photos typically appear that you've just shown? Okay, those photographs pretty much appear in any newspaper that subscribes to those wire services. Uh -huh. And it can be anywhere locally, uh, like in the Cleveland area, Akron area. It can also be um, national and even international. Okay, uh, tell us uh, about some of the famous pe people that you've photographed. Lynn Swan and John Stallworth, both Hall of Fame wide receivers from the Pittsburgh Steelers. Uh -huh. Then we have local TV journalists Fred Griffiths and Connie Deacon. Uh, these were photographed at the Grand Pacific Junction in Olmstead Falls in preparation for Heritage Days there. Then we have Bob Hope. Uh, they had just named a room in his honor at the Cleveland Renaissance Hotel. And something I normally don't do is ask the people that I'm photographing for me to be in a photograph with them, but Bob Hope, I just couldn't resist. Who is your favorite subject? Boy, that's a tough question. There were so many interesting people that I photographed through the years, it's really hard to pinpoint one. I would have to say that um, pretty much anybody who's in front of my lens at the time that I'm doing a photograph, mm -hmm. they become my favorite subject. I see. Uh, what were your, uh, what were some of your responsibilities uh, when you were a medical and public relations photographer uh, at uh, Fairview uh, Hospital uh, in the early 80s? Okay. I didn't realize you were that old. <laughs> I had this photograph or a portrait of myself in my attic that keeps aging. <laughs> I see, I see. You and... Uh, Dorian Gray. Dorian Gray, yes. right. As you can see in this photograph, I was photographing surgeries. The operating room obviously was one place. Wife and child abuse cases, I would be called in, in in the middle of the night to photograph those to document for potential court cases. Okay. Um, public relations photos, whenever the hospital got new equipment or a new um, person on staff that was a major, like a major heart surgeon or whatever, Understand. they needed portraits. Yep. So things like that. Okay. Uh, does your studio restore uh, old damage photos? Yes, uh, that's a very big part of our business now. Here's a, a photograph showing one that's torn, scratched, and missing pieces. Wow. And so you can see the before and after uh -huh. result there. Right. This one was flood damaged. So again, the before and after photographs. And here's uh, one where the original on the left restored it to a nice black and white. And then on the far right, I actually colorized it. So it gives a little more life to it. Wow, wow. Uh, how has digital photo restoration affected the quality of your work? Digital restoration has really been a game changer. Um, back in the old days, um, we used to use a, uh, a camera, as we see there. The, it's a 35 millimeter camera mounted on a copy stand. And we would put the photograph down on the stand. We would take a picture of that, create a negative from that, and then make prints. And then from those prints, we would then have an airbrush artist retouch any of the cracks and scratches and missing pieces. And then from there, we would then photograph that retouched photograph, make a brand new negative, as you can see in the middle there. And then from that brand new negative, we would then create the final prints. Now how we do it is we use a scanner. So we take the old photograph, we scan it, make a high resolution digital file, and then from the digital file, we use a digital artist who will then do the restoration work 
from that digital file, we will then make the final prints. So it's far less steps and the quality is far better than the old way. Besides uh, uh, photo restoration, how do you convert regular photos into art? Well, there's a variety of software that I use. Photoshop is probably the best known, but there's some other ones that I can do some other special effects to. And as we see on this photograph, the uh, top left is the original photograph, which was severely underexposed on the subject. Using Photoshop and some of the other softwares, I was able to bring light back into where it was missing and then emphasize the clouds to give a very dramatic look. And then on this photograph, dropping all the color out except for one area. So here we see the gas pump remains in, in the red color. That's wonderful, Mark. Uh, uh, where can people go to see your artwork? Spectralight.com forward slash artwork. Okay, that sounds great. Easy, too. Uh, earlier, you mentioned that you took 360-degree uh, photos and video of the Genon uh, power plant uh, just after the shutdown in 2022. Uh, what exactly are 360 photos and uh, videos? Uh, and I think you're going to show us a video. So before we look at how to create 360 degree photos and video, I thought I would show the uh, Genon power plant photographs that I did. Great. And this is a web page that I created of some of those images. Here is one of them, and I'm going to make it full screen. And it looks like an ordinary photograph. As I click my mouse on it, I can now scroll around. Yeah, right, right. So you can see a full 360 degrees around this area. I can even look a full 360 degrees up. So that's the flagpole that's behind me. Uh -huh. And then looking down at the ground, there's uh, what the ground looks like. So let's go to one more photo like this. And this is kind of a fun one here. So let's bring this one up big. All right, so this is in the Genon power plant. And once again, I'm gonna just kind of scroll all around on it. And this was the uh, plant manager. Do you remember his name, Rudy? Yes, uh, it was uh, Daniel Rogato. Yes. Junior. Yes. All right, and not only can I spin all around that way, but I can once again look up at the ceiling, down on the floor, and what's even more fun is I can zoom in and out with my mouse. So you can. These will probably be interesting to the Historical Society of Avon Lake. Yes, yes. All right, so that is 360 degree photos. All right, so this is the 360 degree video that I did at Genon. And before I start playing it, I'm just gonna kind of swing around. So this is me and I'm looking at my phone because that's how I monitor what I'm shooting. And in this hand is a long, like a little monopod and it actually has the 360 degree camera at the end of it. But the way this camera works, the, the little monopod disappears, so you don't even see it. Is this you, Rudy, right here? Yep, that's me. And Mr. Rogato? Yes. Okay. And this is Brian, our uh, videographer, who's actually recording today's uh, video <laughs> of our show. Yeah. So before we'll I have to pay him. Yes, uh, we'll have to pay him. So before I start playing it, again, you can even do this on a video, spin all around. You can even make it like a fisheye. Fisheye. And you can also come in close. So let me start playing. All right. So again, it looks like there's a drone flying overhead recording this, but it's my camera on this monopod that we don't see that I'm actually controlling it in my hand. Um, and and it, you're going to show this later on, this piece of equipment. Yes. I'll, I'll show the camera and how that works in a minute. Maybe you can barely see, but here's the, the monopod shadow that's being cast to the floor. So even though we don't see the monopod itself, we see that the shadow being cast. So what's neat about this is I can reframe this video after the fact in any way that I want. I can show it that way. I can look up at the ceiling. I can go side to side to see anything around me. So it almost is like having multiple cameras recording at the same time. We'll stop with that. Let me show what the 360 camera looks like. All right, so here's how a 360 degree camera works. It has two 180 degree lenses. Uh, you've got the one lens here 
and the other lens here. So together they form a 360 degree view. So where the two lenses kind of meet uh, like that, we call that the stitch line, uh, kind of like where my fingers are touching. So at the stitch line, depending on how the camera is turned, you'll actually see an overlap of the two lenses. So you have to be careful where you position the lens or the camera so that you don't put that stitch line in a critical part of the photograph. Then, um, this is, as I said earlier, this is the, the stand that I use to, uh, to move around with. So now let's see what it actually looks like on my phone. All right, so this is obviously recording what, uh, what we are seeing here in the studio. So there's Rudy presently uh, sitting down, and I can spin around. It's kind of hard to do it this way. I'm not used to, uh, to doing it this way. But I'm spinning all around, so you can see the rest of the cameras in the, the studio here. And of course, there's me. And it's even picking up my uh, phone on that lens there. So, and then again, we can look up at the ceiling. And if we look down, notice that when you look down, you see the base of the tripod all the way down on the floor, but you don't see the stand that's, that, it's, that it's resting on. So that disappears. So when I do a 360 photo, I have to then later retouch out the stand out of the photograph. Why don't we get a picture of Rudy and I together? So here is the 360 degree photo that you just saw taken a few moments ago. But you can see, we can simply rotate around in full 360. You can see the rest of the studio that this was recorded at. And once again, looking down at the floor and up at the ceiling. We now rejoin our regularly scheduled program. During the pandemic, how did your search for uh, an elder care facility for your mother-in-law lead uh, you to offering professionally produced uh, 360 uh, degree virtual tours to nursing homes and uh, assisted living facilities? That's a good question, Rudy. The, uh, the pandemic made it difficult for people to visit nursing homes and yep. assisted living facilities. Because of the coronavirus, they were all locked down so that people wouldn't come in and infect the, yeah, the, right, the residents right, there. Right. And my mother-in-law wanted to go around and check out the places we were considering before yeah. the decision was made. But unfortunately, we couldn't do it. And most of the uh, nursing homes just had a couple of photographs on their websites, which doesn't really tell the whole yeah, story. True. So with 360 degree photos, like I demonstrated with Genon, you can look all around and see what there is to offer. So I thought I would do a comparison showing um, the difference between the standard photos that we were seeing and what a 360 uh, photo or video could do uh, that would replace that. So uh, uh, these these 360 photos and videos, you know, they they give you a better tour than uh, the standard photos and, and videos. Yeah, let's take a look to see just what that difference would look like. So here is your standard normal photograph that a typical nursing home might show. This would be of the lobby. And then the exact same photo I then took with a 360 camera. And it almost looks like a video, the way they show the little play button there, but it's not really a video. All you do when you click on it is, well, let me expand it to full screen. Uh, just as I demonstrated early with Genon, Look all around. Look all around. So that way people can see exactly what the facility is going to look like. Um, I'll just do one more like this. A patient room. You know, that's obviously the place where patients yeah. and residents yeah. are going to stay the longest. Spend some time. Yes. So with this, now they have a better idea of what a room could look like. And, and people can zoom in and out just like I'm doing. I'm just using my mouse wheel. Uh, if they're viewing it on a, um, a smartphone, they just pinch on the photo and zoom in and out that way. So let me uh, just get back. All right, so we just looked at a couple of 
static photos and 360 photos. This is a demonstration of videos that some homes would uh, have on their website. And again, it really just shows one view of the facility of each area instead of panning all around like a 360 photo would. The person who's viewing it does not have any control over being able to look all around the way you would on a 360 photo. And then finally, here is a actual virtual tour. And let's go full screen on that. So again, here's the entrance into the nursing home. And all the person needs to do who's viewing this is to click on the little targets to take them from room to room. But before I do that, I can even set up a virtual tour that people can get directions to that facility. It has the nursing home's address pre-filled in, so uh -huh. the person needs to just put in their address and it'll map it out for them. So that's kind of a nice feature. Then if people want to contact the nursing home, they can just click on Contact Us. This opens up a link to the contact page at the nursing home. And a video. So this nursing home had their own video produced, so I can link to their video like that. So it'll then instantly Welcome bring up their home. video. A place for patients. It's a place and then for finally, family, let's go into friends. the tour. So this takes you right to the main lobby as I showed earlier, you know, just doing that. But with a virtual tour, you now connect photographs together so you can go from room to room. Uh, so you can go to main lobby part two. So just by clicking that, it'll just take you to that part. Another way to go from room to room, you can actually jump several rooms ahead if you wish. As you can see, there are thumbnails at the bottom of the screen here. So if you wanted to go to the dining room, and as you hover over it, you can see that it says Atrium Dining Room. So if we click on that, it takes us to the dining room. That's really the, the key difference between regular photos and 360 photos and virtual tours. Well, a lot better. Uh, what are some other applications of 360 uh, degree virtual tours? There are so many places that businesses can use them. Uh -huh. Museums, hotels, funeral homes, restaurants, schools, daycares, police and fire stations, sporting venues, doctors and dentist offices, Airbnb, tourist attractions, churches, synagogues, hospitals, fitness centers, really anybody who has a physical location can benefit from a virtual tour. Okay. Uh, do 360-degree uh, photos increase uh, a business's uh, ranking in uh, Google search results uh, when consumers are shopping for products and services in their local areas? Most definitely. Google really appreciates the 360-degree photographs that they give more stock to a company that has those on their Google business page than those who don't just to see how that plays out. I posted a number of 360 degree photos for area businesses, and this keeps track of the views that my photographs have gained since I've been posting them. And this little icon here shows that I have 241 photographs that I posted that are 360. And at this very moment, those 241 images have garnered 3,965,000 views. Wow. Well, you've told us about the equipment uh, uh, to create a virtual tour. Uh, uh, how do you go about doing it? It's a, it's a pretty laborious process. The, um, after capturing the images, then I have to retouch out the bottom of the, uh, the stand that we yep. saw. I got gotcha. you. Color correct, exposure correct. Next, I need to use a proprietary software to link all of the different 360 degree photos into the virtual tour. So using the example of the nursing home we looked at earlier, here is the photograph of the dining room. So when I click on it, you can see the menu options for this picture. And right here it says atrium dining room. I can change that to anything that I want. I can also scroll down and make further adjustments. For example, if the picture seems to be leaning too much to one side, I can use this level correction adjustment to change that. Then I need to set up all of the different locations that you can go from one to the next. There are other settings that we can adjust as well. So once I'm satisfied with what I've created, I generate embed code that I give to the client so that they can put that on their website, which will allow anyone who visits that page to take the virtual tour. Uh, how long does all this take? 
Well, shooting the virtual tour is probably the quickest part because I cannot use lighting, studio lighting, in the rooms that I'm photographing, because if I did, they would show up in the photographs. Yeah, you'd see all the lights. <laughs> you would, yes, you'd see the lights. In fact, I can't be in the room either, uh, so I have to find a place to hide so that I don't show up in the photograph. I would say it probably takes roughly three to four hours to photograph between 15 and 20 photographs in the facility that I'm photographing. Then the editing process uh, back in my, in my office probably takes a couple of days to mm -hmm. eliminate the, the monopod stand, uh, do the color corrections and whatnot, and then connect everything together. Yeah, but it, it makes it so much more efficient for, you, for a, a, a viewer to, to use your, your uh, virtual tour than to have to you know, get in a car or on an airplane and, and go to a place and, and tour it. Exactly. Uh, uh, what is your website address and your email for your business? Yeah, it's uh, www.spectralight.com. Email is info at spectralight.com. Uh, phone number, uh, it's a landline, so if people try to call, they need to um, call, not try to uh, text because I won't get their messages. Okay. And that number is 440 748 Six three zero zero. Okay. Uh, in summary, uh, what makes sense to you regarding three hundred and sixty degree photos for businesses, and and what doesn't make sense? I would say it makes sense to have them for businesses. You bet. Because Google number one is going to notice that and direct more traffic to those websites that have the three hundred and sixty photos or have the three hundred and sixty virtual tours. Same for their Google business uh, profile. 360 photos posted there will come up first in search results. And if you're not coming up first in search, when people are looking for you, you may not come up at all. At all, right. Yes. Thank you for watching our show. Uh, please give us feedback on the show. Uh, if you know someone who's interesting, uh, please uh, send us that, uh, uh, their contact information. And uh, remember that uh, seatbelts save lives.